All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for taking some time to join us today. Uh, we have a webinar on preparing for the unexpected, uh, creating an emergency action plan for your restaurant, something we don't put enough time and thought into until something really happens and then it's too late. So hopefully this will give you some good guidance toward getting things prepared before you need anything. Uh, first, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, this will be a slideshow today. Uh, so you can kind of follow along with what we're saying. Uh, after the live presentation, the webinar will be re it's recorded, so it'll be available for any time uh, on societyinsurance.com under the risk management and education training, also on Society Insurance's YouTube channel. So if it's something, uh, if you are an agent and have insured, you want to recommend watch it, or if you if you're a restaurant owner and want to have your management staff watch it, they can always go to the YouTube channel and watch it for free anytime on demand. Uh, at the end, we'll have a question and answer period. So anytime throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, you can type them into the, the questions bar on the control panel, and we'll take a look at those at the end and answer anything we can. We are also coming to you live right now from our remote offices across several different states. So there is the possibility of a technical glitch here or there, or I have a lovely little chihuahua that likes to have a speaking role in every webinar I do. So hopefully not, but please forgive us if there are any little technical glitches. So before we start, just a quick overview of Society Insurance, if you're not familiar. Uh, we're a regional insurance carrier that's based in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. We currently, we do business in uh, in nine states, we're in Wisconsin, let's see, many, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Tennessee, Colorado, Georgia, Texas. Uh, we've been writing workers' comp coverage since 1915, but today we also do property liability, commercial auto coverage, uh, cyber liability, things like that. Uh, we really have an extensive knowledge uh, in protecting the hospitality industry in, in particular. Uh, our specialty is providing insurance for the select business niches with the focus on small details that make the biggest difference. So a little bit about the presenters today. My name is Shelby Blundell. I'm a risk improvement rep with Society Insurance. Been with them since 2010. I uh, have a master's degree in uh, biosecurity and disaster preparedness, so it kind of falls right into our topic today. I, I am in the Chicago area, but I handle the Northern Illinois and Chicago area work for this for the company. Today we also have Alex Jones with us. You want to say hi? Hey, my name is Alex Jones. I've been with uh, I'm a risk control representative for Society for about three years now. My territory includes the entire state of Tennessee. I graduated from Middle Tennessee State University with a degree in risk management and insurance. I'm currently a walkway auditor certificate holder through the National Floor Safety Institute. Um, passing it back to you, Shelby. All right, then we've also got Susan with us today. Hello there, I'm Susan Lynn. I've been with Society since just February of this year, but I've been in the insurance industry for over 23 years um, in multiple capacities from claims to loss control. So um, risk control, um, happy to be here. So back to you, Shelby. And we got Jason Kern also. Hello, my name is Jason Kern. I'm a risk control representative with Society. I've been with Society since January of 2023. My territory is Minnesota and Northwestern Wisconsin, and I have a master's in risk control and safety management. Passing it back to you, Shelby. All right, awesome. Um, just a quick disclaimer. You know, today today's environment, we have to have a little disclaimer on everything, so let's take a quick look at that. And we will move on. Our learning objective today will identify common emergency scenarios impacting restaurants, identify steps in emergency response to help minimize those losses, and then review the goals of contingency planning and discuss planning resources. So we'll just start out getting everybody thinking a little bit with a poll question. Let everybody take a second to answer that. How long can food stay safe in a walk-in cooler during a power loss? Is that one hour, be four hours, 
D 12 hours or D 24 hours? Like everybody's, everybody's kind of leaning towards the four hours, but a few thinking about the, the 12 hour window. It looks like most people have gotten their answer in. Looks like most people are saying, 48% are saying four hours. Alex, what's your answer on that one? Yeah, so the, the correct answer is around four hours. If the doors are kept shut and you have a good seal on the door, um, if food is kept at a temperature of 40 degrees or more for more than two hours, though, that food will have to be discarded. Okay, so kind of get into power loss, kind of the poll question was kind of on that topic. Uh, power loss, whether caused by natural disasters, infrastructure issues, or other unforeseen events can disrupt the heartbeat of your business. Power loss can affect everything from your ability to serve your customers to the safety of your food inventory. So let's talk a little bit about the various causes of power loss. There are about five common types of reasons why power issues occur. Um, kind of the most common is weather related, infrastructure issues, grid, grid overloads, equipment failures, scheduled outages. And so keeping those in mind, let's talk about what to do in those type of power outage events. First, it's always uh, is always be prepared for these type of events. These are things that you can do today to put your restaurant in a better position to face a power loss. It is important to have an emergency plan, backup power source for important equipment like refrigerators, freezers, to save perishable bottoms. Uh, make sure your emergency lighting is installed, ensure all exits are well lit, and uh, food safety protocols to ensure perishable items remain safe to serve. Uh, it is important to practice the response to a power outage to ensure that all staff is well trained to face this type of event. So we're gonna start talking about response a little bit. So whenever a power loss occurs, always remain calm and prioritize the safety of your customers and your staff. This is when uh, the power loss emergency plan should be initiated. Uh, the first step is to assess the power loss. Uh, first thing I would do is inform the local power company that your power is currently out and see how widespread the issue is. Depending on how large the power outage it may be, uh, they may be able to provide a rough estimate for how long the outage will occur. So for instance, if it's just a transformer is blown in your neighborhood, they may be able to get to that pretty quickly and fix it. Um, so the kind of the big important thing, especially for the restaurants, uh, without power, the ventilation systems over the hoods or over the cooking equipment aren't able to function. Therefore, all cooking operations should be seized uh, and then make sure all backup lighting is functioning properly to ensure that empl employees and guests can exit the building if necessary. Um, if you were able to buy a backup generator, bring those in and prioritize the cooler and freezers to ensure that they continue to make, maintain safe temperatures. Uh, if backup generators are not present, keep a log every two hours of the cooler and freezer temperatures to ensure that their temperature remains safe. Again, if they're above 40 degrees for more than two hours, that uh, food will have to be discarded. Uh, it is also important to communicate to staff and customers of any operational hour changes or schedule changes for employees uh, due to the power outage. Um, I always suggest making a company social media post to alert customers that you're not no longer operational. Uh, okay, so once power is res restored, the first thing to do is make sure all critical equipment like refrigeration and food storage is uh, functioning properly. Uh, I would also make sure that all point of sale systems are, are open where you can still take credit card transactions. Uh, I would my next thing would be is make sure all transactions uh, made shortly before the outage have been recovered in, without corruption or loss. Um, this is where I would also alert uh, employees that they're th of the schedule changes. Uh, another social media post would probably be a great idea to let your customer base know that you are back open for business. So we're kind of getting into uh, weather, um, kind of the leading cause for power outages for the most part. Uh, severe weather can happen at any point, so it's important to always be prepared for uh, weather related events. The best way to be prepared is to practice drills with your employees to ensure that they know what to do in the event of a severe weather occurs during operational hours. Practicing these drills on a frequent basis keeps the drills fresh on the employees' minds. A list of contacts should be posted in commonplace to ensure that all important contacts are notified of any changes to the status of the business. The contact list should be consist of managers, uh, owners of the business, emergency service, utility companies, and if you're leasing, the building owner. Uh, I would always suggest adding a weather radio to your business because um, sometimes when you're in the heat of the moment working, you may not always be up to date on the, the current weather conditions. So the weather radio would let you know if there's any 
uh, warning or watches issued. And then every quarter, I would make a routine inspection to make sure all controls are in place. So, you know, practicing drills, making sure your weather radio is functioning properly, uh, check generators, backup power sources, stuff like that. Um, so preparing for a restaurant for a tornado or any other severe weather event is essential to ensure the safety of both customers and staff, as well as to protect your property. The key part of preparing your staff for tornadoes is to designate a place within the building that can be a shelter area for customers and staff. So obviously, uh, a place away from the windows and kind of the lowest um, middle part of the building to uh, protect employees. So what's the difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning? Uh, watch is a preliminary announcement that indicates the potential for tornadoes, while a tornado warning is a more urgent notice that a tornado is imminent or already occurring. It is important to take both types of alerts seriously, but particularly heed tornado warnings as they require immediate action to ensure your safety. Staying informed through weather alerts, sirens, and media sources is crucial during severe weather events to protect yourself and your property. Okay, so flooding. Uh, for flooding risk, a lot of it does depend on where your business is situated and where the water runs. Uh, for example, if your location is on top of a mountain, you may not worry with flooding risk. However, if the location is an area where flooding occur, it's always important to be prepared for these type of events. Uh, I would suggest keeping sandbags and other flood barriers on hand is always a good idea. And then make sure whenever it does start to flood, direct put those flood barriers and sandbags that are situated direct water away from the building. If water starts to leak, use a pump to pump the water out and away from the building. Uh, having a pump on hand is also useful if a leak or a hot water heater were to burst just to get water out as quickly as possible and make sure that your area is as dry as possible. Once again, trading with staff members is always important to sure, be sure that they're prepared for any type of flooding event. And again, communicate uh, your business and stakeholders if necessary to protect them. Thunderstorms may not be as severe as other weather-related weather events, but they still pose a risk to your business. Thunderstorms can move quickly and change weather conditions pretty drastically in a matter of a couple minutes. If you do have outdoor seating, a procedure should be implemented to bring customers inside promptly. If there are umbrellas or other objects that can be easily picked up by the wind, those should be secured. This is to prevent those objects uh, from flying around and damaging property or, you know, impelling somebody. You don't want an umbrella flying around and get stuck in someone's body or the, the windshield. Uh, once everyone is back inside and everything is secured, then all staff should remain inside until weather has calmed down. And again, check with local weather stations and the radar to keep tabs on the weather. After the weather event, an inspection process should be conducted to see if damage to uh, the premise, if there's been any damage, begin filling out an incident report or documenting any damages with uh, photos. So uh, we get into snow. If you're like me in Tennessee, we don't get a, a ton of snow, but when we do, no one's ever prepared and they forget how to drive. So to be prepared for snow is to stay on top of the weather conditions to see when the snow is gonna fall. Prepare for the snow by salting entrances and sidewalks, and then establish a snow removal plan and schedule for clearing park lots, walkways, and entrances promptly after snowfall. Whether that is you as a business owner that's clearing the park lot, trained employees, or hiring a service to take care of the park lot, it's always important to keep a log of when the clearing was performed. And then keep a supply of salt or ice melt on hand to prevent ice patches throughout operational hours. Again, it's important to keep a log every time you salt or apply ice melt. As a business owner, it is important to make sure that the exits are clear and accessible. But what you don't want is snow piling up on in front of exit doors, preventing someone to exit the building in case of emergency. Um, and then if snow is so severe and employees can't make it to work in Tennessee, that's about a quarter of an inch of snow, it's important to communicate to employees and customers uh, and changes of operational hours. So last type of severe weather we're going to talk about is uh, if a wildfire is happening in your area, the highest priority is to stay informed of the fire. Life safety should always take priority over any building. Keep a close eye on evacuation notices and air quality reports from local authorities. If evacuation notice is given, promptly communicate to your business stakeholders out of the building and then provide instructions to head the correct evacuation route. It is important to keep combustibles like wood and propane ticks away from the building and keep plant and tree foliage away from the building to reduce the likelihood of flammability for your business. Wildfires are unpredictable, so always keep tabs with the local authorities to keep yourself and your staff safe. And then I'm going to throw it back to Shelby. All right, a lot of good info there. 
you know, during COVID, we, we just saw an explosion in people doing outside patio dining. Um, and, and a lot of people were just going to Home Depot and getting some kind of a gazebo or whatever. Um, most cities kind of developed guidelines as to what's acceptable for uh, patio dining, uh, the way that the tents are mounted to the ground and everything. I know the city of Chicago developed a really good thing that, that each community probably has one, but if anybody wants to go to the city of Chicago's website, there's a really, really in-depth thing on, on exactly how like tents should be constructed, how they should be secured, all of that, you know, because that just a good gust of wind could take a, a tent or something like that and really cause problems. So I would take a take a second to look at something like that and make sure you have everything properly secured and mounted and then using the appropriate kind of tent or gazebo or whatever for outdoor dining. I've got another quick poll question. According to the National Fire Protection Association, what percent of restaurant fires are caused by the deep fat fryers? They make delicious French fries, but they also make lovely fires that we don't like. I'll give everybody a second to kind of chime in here. Looks like most people are leaning towards 31%. I'll give another second here and let everybody get a chance to answer. It looks like most people have answered and looks like most people are saying, uh, 31%. Jason, what's your answer on that one? That is actually 21% from the data that I was able to find for that. So I like where everyone's head at. Head is at with 31% because it's always better to be more safe than less. So I'm going to talk a little bit about fire damage now. And this is some of the things that I look at when I go to a restaurant location, I'll look at the deep fat fryer, make sure it's 16 inches away from any open flame appliances. And that is usually a gas burner stove. And if it is less than the 16 inches, then is it separated by an eight inch high shield? And then is there any grease accumulating on any of the equipment or exhaust hood? That's usually a visual inspection. And then I'll also verify that the UL 300 system is inspected per the fire codes and that it has not been red tagged for non-compliance and that it's been inspected within the last six months. And then I'll verify if employees know where the UL 300 manual activation device is and if they know that it's different than the sprinkler system if your building has a sprinkler system. And if you don't know what a UL 300 system is, that is the fire suppression system inside of the exhaust hood in your kitchen. So when you're thinking about fire damage in your restaurant, you need to first assess what the loss severity and likelihood of a loss is going to be in kind of look around and see what your cooking operations are. Are you performing solid fuel cooking, which is wood burning equipment, and that's going to increase your risk for a fire. And then some of the other things could be your wall decor, if your building has a sprinkler system. And then if you're in a multi-unit building, what are your tenants that are next to you doing? And all of those things are going to increase or decrease the likelihood of a fire happening. And then if you are unfortunate enough to have a fire, then you need to look at what was affected. That is going to be part of your response to that. Was it a small area, large area? And that's looking at was it just in the kitchen or the dining room? What equipment or product was affected? and knowing how easily it is to replace your equipment. And then was the building structure affected? Was, if you're in a multi-unit building, was it just your space or was it someone else's space as well? Was there smoke damage going throughout? And then you'll need to look a little bit into recovery. Is an inspection needed before you can open? Do you know who needs to inspect your facility and how long it'll take to get them out to your property for that. And then your cost and time to fix and build. 
can you just remodel or do you have to do a complete uh, tear down and build new? And then do you have a list of contractors already in place for that? So you can call them if you do have an issue with a fire. And then also looking at if you have a food truck or other equipment that can help keep your kitchen open, assuming you had a loss in your kitchen. And then if you are operating out of a food truck and you don't normally have one, do you have a limited food menu that you can use? And then some stats here about theft and crime. 75% of all employees steal from the workplace at least once and half will steal again. And eating and drinking establishments account for the eighth most common setting for violent crimes. And in 2020, that was over 10,000 violent crimes, which was about 2% of the total of violent crimes. And within that 10,000 number was 76 murders and 5,642 robberies. So after hearing some of those stats about crime, you might be asking how you can protect yourself from property theft. And it, again, like with fire, you wanna look at an assessment. What is the loss severity and likelihood of a loss? Are you in an area that has a higher crime rate? Do you have items in your building that are easily stolen? And then some of the things to help prevent that for theft, you really need to be proactive and have things already in place before you have a theft, such as cameras, and make sure they have complete coverage, of both inside and outside of the building. Make sure you have good inventory management so that if there is a loss, you are aware of what is missing. And then indoor, outdoor lighting, background checks. I'm finding a lot of places I've recently visited are getting employees to consent to a background check, but not spending the finances to run the background check. But if they do have an issue, they already have that paperwork signed. So that might be something to think about. And then if your employees know the consequences of theft. And make if you do have, or if you think there's a risk of theft, it's always a good idea to have some type of written policy for that, and then go into a little bit of detail of what exactly you can, when you can exactly accuse an employee of theft. Do they need one witness, two witnesses? Do you want to have them on video? And then if you aren't proactive, then you're going to be reactive, which means you already had a theft happen. And then hopefully you have cameras installed, but do you know the length of your camera feed? Is it 30 days, which is the minimum that we like to see, or is it just live feed only? So it's good that you have cameras, but know the length of the data storage. And then make sure all of your inventory is up to date. And then recovery, is it possible to get full recovery costs? And that's more of a question for if you have some items in your restaurant that have maybe sentimental value to you, or if they're unreplaceable, such as sports memorabilia, or I've seen places that have world record animal mounts that can't easily be replaced. So next slide, I'm gonna go over some kind of what if scenarios for property theft. So your alarm system was just activated. Do your employees know how to turn off the alarm? Do they know what number, if any, will the alarm company call before notifying the police? Usually there's a, the alarm goes off, it might go to an owner or a manager, but sometimes it, if you don't have that set up, it might not ring anywhere. Do employees know the correct response if the alarm company calls them, a lot of times there's a, a challenge code and an authorization to make sure everything is safe in the facility. And do employees know how to reset the alarm? 
a lot of times that's a different code than just the entry code. And then do you know if you have any service fees for your alarm system? Sometimes after two or three false alarms, they'll start charging you. So I'll talk a little bit about property theft. So someone enters your restaurant and they demand cash. One of the things you need to think about for that is do you even have cash on site? A lot of places are going to very limited or no cash operations. Do you have a policy for employee compliance, which is always a good thing to have? Have your employees been properly trained in how to handle that? And then some of the questions you should also ask is what if they have a weapon? And what if they're a past employee? Because those are all different scenarios you can run across. And then intellectual theft is something that you might not have thought about before, but it's it's always good to maybe think about it a little bit. And I got to give the disclaimer, review any intellectual theft concerns with your qualified legal counsel. So some things for that would be, are your names, logos, and brands trademarked? If you even think you need to trademark them, is your restaurant decor similar to another competitor's restaurant? Or if you have any trade secrets, recipes, prep methods that can be trademarked? Do you have employees sign any confidential agreements? And then lastly, talk a little bit about cyber theft. It's becoming more and more common. I'm sure some of you have received notices from your vendors saying that their emails have been hacked. I know I've gotten emails from my employer saying not to open any emails from this person or that person. So if, you, if your account is hacked, cyber thieves are a lot of times are looking for invoices. If you have large invoices of say five or $10,000 that are processing at the same time and you're approving them, they will try to send you a fake email with an invoice and then you'll approve it and you'll end up giving them the money instead of the, the vendor you were trying to pay. And some other information that can be stolen, credit card information, employee and customer personal information. And then also you need to look at if your employee information is posted. A lot of times you'll have a bulletin board, which you might think it's something simple, work schedules, phone numbers, but that's all information that someone could get a hold of and use that for cyber theft. And that goes into social engineering. And some of the common things for social engineering is phishing, which is fraudulent sending of emails, malware, which is software designed to damage or gain unauthorized access to a computer system. And then always Keep in mind your password management. Do you have the same password for everything? And are you using two-factor authentication? That's These are all some things that can help with cyber theft. Thank you for your time for a little bit about fire damage and theft protection. And now I'm going to pass it over to Susan for a little bit about medical preparedness. Thank you, Jason. Um, yeah, just moving on to a lot of information we've gone over, but just want to start with medical reporting um, that we have, what to, what to do, what, where do you start? Um, who, who does your medical reporting? Um, is it HR? Is it a manager of each department or each area of, of, of each of front, you know, front of the house, back of the house, so forth? Um, and then if they're gone, who is the backup? Um, do you report the when we have no power do we have written copies somewhere um, I know people are trying to go power um, it's good to have maybe copies somewhere to, to do that so when what when do we when do we report an injury is it immediate 24 hours so I highly suggest make sure it's within immediately so we get all the information right away um, you start to forget what exactly happened, how it happened, that kind of thing. So um, it's just kind of good to make sure we have all that information. 
Um, and then what information to gather. So the time of the incident, the date that it happened, the type of the injury, of course, the body parts, the circumstance where it happened, and then the need for medical attention. And of course, a nice example of employee injury. And if you have a nice claim kit or whatever you have, um, making sure you have all this documentation, the up-to-date information handy for individuals to write down or online, however you, wherever you store the information. This is great to have available for, and just making sure you have the information, the backup, and, and so forth. Next slide. So medical reporting, um, the next would be accident first. So this is kind of a, just a deeper dive into maybe what happened. So making sure what happened, get the information right away, you know, for a look of there's something that needs to be addressed right away, gathering it what happened, was there any witnesses to the of how what the, of the injury? Maybe the doctor or the hospital where it occurred. So we need to gather that for the adjuster so we can pass that information on. Um, and maybe is there something that we can prevent um, in the future, can we look into that and from an organization, maybe look into how it happened, where it happened, is there something that we can fix and move forward so it doesn't happen again? And maybe is there from a, ha a hazard perspective, do we need to address some, um, uh, fix it so don't get injured and, and so forth right away? Next slide, please. The other Option two is doing an accident investigation. This is more of taking the employee's perspective and also uh, maybe a safety committee's perspective of reviewing the incident and going deeper into the root cause of what of the injury, how it happened, um, and maybe diving into um, what body part, how, how the injury was occurring, maybe it's repetitive, maybe it's something that we can kind of prevent, maybe we can redo how the setup of where where they were working, um, improving the workflows, um, getting suggestions from employees. They've been working there for maybe a while or maybe just started, but they have a perspective that we didn't maybe think of. So this is just a form that you can fill out, but you also just taking a step back, like just looking at the analysis of like, what can we do to improve the workflow, maybe improve how food is getting out, how employees are working, coming and going, um, and then just making sure that the employees are safe and then maybe have the section. We can have a good conversation with the employees to say, hey, I'm looking out for you. There's maybe some ideas that you can have and have their input and then they feel like they have a part in, in this to make sure that they're working in a, in a safe environment as well. Next slide, please. Just this is a good slide to talk about. Um, just overview the types of um, injuries that can occur. I know there's probably a few more, but this is the the biggest one. Slips and falls is probably the biggest one, and in, in the restaurant industry as well as other industries too. But slips and falls is the top one. Food allergies, medical emergencies from both um, employees and customers too. That seems to be growing as well, unfortunately. Um, cuts, scrapes, and puncture wounds, and then sprains and strains, and then as well as burns and scalds too. And then next slide. And then we have medical safety. This is we're going to take a look at first aid kits. Now, everybody has maybe different types of cooking equipment, so you're going to want to maybe look at what's in your first aid kit, proper supplies that are appropriate for your specific needs. Sometimes you might need gloves, sometimes you might need um, tweezers. You might not need all of that was pictured there, but also looking at what do we need and putting those appropriate items in the first aid kit. Um, and then making sure people are properly trained to use those items, such as maybe an AED that you have on site. If you have one, just making sure that everybody is trained on how to use them um, on site. Or CPR, if you're gonna have, if that's a very great tool to have 
um, and making sure you have, or just making sure you have the equipment or first aid process to go through. Either or whether it's just calling 911 and that's your procedure, having that set procedures in place so everybody knows that that's what we do, that is fantastic. Um, as a side, we also have nurse triage resource that you can call and talk to a nurse to go through some steps in place to talk to a nurse to say, hey, I'm not sure how this injury, it's kind of severe, but I'm not sure if we need to go get treatment or if it's just first day, we need a Band-Aid. So it's a great resource that we have that you can talk through some injuries that maybe are borderline and, and so forth. So there are resources out there for you to talk through um, some scenarios as well as just making sure that you have what you need um, that you at your at your location. So thank you very much. All right. Yeah, it's amazing the the accessibility of AEDs, the automated external defibrillators have become so much easier to get and have in place. And the save rate on those is phenomenal. They've also made a lot of updates to the recommendations for CPR. A lot of people were scared of uh, getting something, diseases or whatever, from having contact mouth to mouth and stuff. And a lot of the new recommendations are taking that mouth to mouth piece out of it and just doing chest compression. So it makes it a lot easier and, and stuff for people to do it. So something to think about having all your staff certified in CPR. So they might use it at your workplace or at home or who knows where. I've got another quick question. We'll do this one quick here. Uh, what percent of business businesses reopen after a disaster? So if they have something like building destroyed by a tornado, uh, is it 15%, B 30%, C 50%, or D 80%? So, looks like a lot of people getting their answers in here. Most people are leaning toward 30 percent. I'll go ahead and close it. Looks like most people are saying 30 percent. The actual answer is 50 percent. So about about half of restaurants uh, just don't ever reopen after there's a major disaster. Uh, so you know it all comes down to your your planning and preparedness and that kind of starts into what I'm going to talk about for just a second here and that's the business continuity planning. Uh, We've heard several times throughout the presentation that the terms assessment, response, and recovery. You know, it's always about preparedness, then how you respond to it, and how you recover from it. Uh, business continuity planning doesn't have to be a big hassle, but it's something you need to do before the, before disaster strikes. So with with business continuity planning, you're trying to minimize your losses, your losses of life, loss of property. Uh, you want to ensure the continuous performance of your essential functions, keep your business going, keep the money coming in, uh, keep taking care of your neighbors, uh, protect the essential facilities and equipment, records, assets, things like that, and make sure you don't lose anything more than you have to, and also mitigate disruptions of the operation. Uh, most of the businesses we work with, uh, Society Insurance, we deal mostly with the mom and pop operations, uh, so there's not a big you're not just like a store number. You're not store number 82 out of 500. Uh, you have your one restaurant and that is your livelihood. Uh, so if your doors are closed for just a day or two, or if it's even a month or whatever, it can be really devastating, you know, and that, that, that doesn't go back into corporate numbers. That, that's what you go home and talk about at the dining room table. You know, if your business is closed, you have no money coming in. So 10% of the effects of a disaster are the actual disaster and about 90 percent is how you respond to it so you know go continuity planning is getting the right questions answered and making the right decisions uh, entering into good agreements and things like that before you ever need uh, something like that to come into play um business owners you're going there's a lot you're thinking about on a daily basis uh, you know got to order your food for the next three weeks you, you've got two employees that have just not shown up or quit on you, uh, busy lunch rush. There's, there's just a million different things going on on a daily basis. And so you're not sitting around thinking about continuity planning or what if we have a tornado or whatever. So really the time to do it ahead of time, like right now when you don't have anything going on, so you can be prepared for when something does happen. Uh, 
So it just takes a little bit of time, a little bit of effort. Um, there's also different things to think about. Uh, major, a major regional flood would be a really big disaster. Uh, be something that would definitely make the national news. But there may be a lot smaller, like a local power outage that isn't a big news event, but it still totally affects you and your business. So, um, so if you're without power, you could lose thousands of dollars in cold storage and take a big hit on your your business income. But if you've already thought ahead and made a contract with a local vendor for a portable uh, generator, they can have it on site very quickly, uh, have you keep you up and running. And there's also a little more of a thought that it's not just, it, it is about you and your business, but it's also some neighborhoods, your, your little grocery store or your small restaurant may be the only source of food for the elderly couple down the street that doesn't have any kind of transportation. So it also is taking care of your neighbor. Uh, it also gives you a good reputation when things happen. Uh, you know, the news is always going to focus on whoever botched a response. And if you have all of that in place, that just looks good for you. Um, so where do we start with business continuity planning? It doesn't have to be something that's just hugely complicated. I've worked with business continuity plans that were hundreds of pages and had lots of legal documents and everything but they don't have to be that complicated. Uh, if you remember the, the movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, a few years back, Will Smith was in it. Uh, he was playing the role of Chris Gardner. Uh, Chris had a major business, and I have a copy of his business continuity plan, and it was one single page. I, I don't think that's sufficient, but it's more than, you know, than nothing. So it, it's just kind of an example that it doesn't have to be a long, very tedious thing. You just really have to start with the very basics and get them on paper. You know, some very basic things like where the fire extinguishers are, where the circuit breaker panels are, uh, contact, contact information for like mitigation and remediation contractors who might do board up or things like that to protect the property, keep it from having additional damage. Um, they're, they're really basic things, but, uh, they're things that during a major disaster, you don't have time to think about those things. And then there's also the chance that if you're off site, if you're, if you're on vacation and you have your assistant manager running the show, they may not know where like the water valve shut off is, but if they know that they can go grab the business continuity plan and it has a list of all of these things, you know, how to, how to access the sprinkler room, how to shut off uh, the main water, how to all those things. It, it takes the question marks out of a lot of things. You can, you know, just, you can train them to, hey, grab this book and it has all of these answers before you ever need them. So there's a lot of places to start. FEMA uh, and ready.gov both have templates that you can use, but they're really designed, they're templates that are made for uh, any size business or any type of business. So they're very generic, they're scalable, but I would honestly say they're not designed just for the small mom and pop restaurants like most of you guys are. Uh, a good starting point, in my opinion, I did a full webinar on business continuity planning a few years ago. And there's a the web address there for our YouTube channel and the link to it. You can go look at that. That would be a really good starting point because I focus specifically on the mom and pop restaurants and bars and grocery stores and things like that so you're not being lumped into a, a group that, that might be a warehouse or different things like that that have nothing to do with you it's more specific information that would be valuable for you guys so with that there's also uh, some other resources we have our blog uh, we have a lot of blogs on a lot of different topics but a lot of emergency planning emergency response uh, a lot of or dive into very specific topics uh, that we touched on briefly today, but they, they go into in-depth. Uh, also the handouts, societyinsurance.com under risk management. We have lots of handouts under every topic imaginable, but there are a lot of my emergency planning, emergency response, uh, and how to handle different things like that. So with that, I will see if there are any questions that we've had come in. Let me do a quick check. And, um, first one is, 
they ask if you had one piece of equipment that seems to be the most important to have on hand in case of a power loss emergency, what would you say that would be? Alex, what, that was kind of in your section. What would you say on that? Yeah, I definitely would say having a backup generator of some sort, uh, whether it be a gas one or just some larger backup battery bank, just to be able to keep your, um, I apologize if you can hear my dog, uh, just some kind of source of power to keep your coolers and freezers still functioning properly. Because, I mean, that's really where a big portion of uh, power loss would be as far as the loss goes. It's just losing your inventory on food product because you'd have to wait for it to get shit back in if you have to discard everything and then ultimately the cost of losing the food as well. Okay. Yeah, it's always good. And again, that goes kind of back into the business continuity planning. If you can't, if you can't afford to buy a generator, then now's the time to go find a local contractor that would have one available. And it could even be like a construction contractor that if there's a major storm, they're not going to be doing their construction. So you might be able to make a deal with them, but Hey, if, if this happens, you bring your generator to my my place, we hook it up, we keep going. So even if you can't afford one, there's always time for planning now to make it happen. Uh, the other one I've got here is uh, they say that they are the manager of a, a small restaurant, and they've always been curious if they step out of the office and, and see like an armed robbery taking place, is there a recommended course of action with that? Uh, would that kind of fit with Jason's topic? Jason, what do you think? Well, that's a really good question. In in general, you always want to be compliant with whatever their demands are and non-combative and just go along with them. I will say because I mentioned the armed robbery, I said be non-combative, but if you if they decide to want to take you off your property location, your likelihood of injury increases quite a bit if you leave the primary building area that they were robbing and then also that's there's so many different variables for a question like that you might want to reach out to your local police department and see if they have any recommendations or if they can guide you but in general be compliant and non-combative yeah that's a topic that you could really talk about for a very, very long time. So a lot of local police departments offer some training and stuff like that, or or will work with you if you contact them and say, hey, what would you like us to do as as your local police department? And they'll work with you and help train your staff in a lot of places. That is the last of the questions that I had come in. So with that, I will say thank you very much for joining us. I would say one of my key takeaways for everybody is Right now is the time to take a minute to prepare for things. Uh, Don't wait until something happens. The results and getting back running after a disaster, 90% of it depends on how prepared you are and how you respond. So now when there's nothing happening is the time to consider all of these different variables and get things in place and make it easy, as easy easy as possible to respond. But thank you for joining us. and like you said, you can go to societyinsurance.com to learn more about the company or to look at any of our resources uh, or our YouTube channel to watch the video of the presentation. But thanks again for joining us. Hope everybody has a good day, and we will see you next time. Thank you.